Um, we have a, an exciting and fascinating panel discussion planned today with uh, actually three guest speakers with me today. I think, unfortunately, Marjan was not able to join us. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit about the structure of the session. So all in all, we have um, an hour and 15 minutes for the session. And the way we're going to run it is we're going to focus on demystifying CBDCs. We're going to sort of level set and baseline understanding of the vision for digital pound. And Nick is going to start with opening remarks. Um, we're, then we're going to hear a perspective from commercial banks. So Rhiannon is, is going to cover that. And we have Catherine covering the broader market participants' perspective. Um, we're going to probably dedicate 30 minutes for Q&A and make it very much interactive discussion so that you have a chance to ask questions. And um, with that, I'd like to introduce the panelists. Um, Nick, would you like to go first? Yeah, absolutely. Just a quick intro. Just, just a quick, quick intro. intro. Uh, so my name's uh, Nick Butts. Uh, over the last kind of two or three years, I've been the head of the Future of Money uh, division at the Bank of England. Had two sets of responsibilities within that role. One was the strategy and economics work related to digital currencies and particularly CBDC. But perhaps slightly unusually for some central banks, I was also responsible for fiscal currency, so both forward-looking uh, policy to protect access to cash and also all of our analytical and comms work as well. So that's me. Thank you. Rhiannon. Hello. Good morning. Um, my name is Rhiannon Butterfield, and as the slide behind me says, uh, I work for UK Finance as a principal in our payments and innovation team. Um, and actually, it's really relevant to be sat here next to Nick because we have <laughs> quite a, sim a similar kind of, you know, history of our roles. Um, in, at the moment, what I currently manage is on the one side of my desk, our work on wholesale cash, and on the other side of my desk, our work on new digital assets and money. Um, and actually, over time, I found that to be a really neat intersection between old money and new money. Um, I think there's a lot to learn between the two. Um, and, and obviously, while one could draw a trajectory that says cash is going down and new digital assets and money are on the rise, um, I think that from the consumer perspective, you know, we still clearly see that um, the latter is incredibly important to consumers and businesses. Um, so actually, it's quite a nice way to, to kind of manage my work in that I can look at both sides of that changing um, economy. Thank you. And Catherine. Hi. Thank good you. morning, everyone. Hopefully, you can hear me. Just turn it up a little bit. OK, excellent. Um, well, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm unfortunately based out of California, so couldn't actually attend this uh, event um, in person. But very nice to meet you all. Um, I am from Visa. I'm the global head of CBDC and protocols. Um, I sit on the, the product side. So we lead a team of uh, product engineers really looking for infrastructure related um, components in which that would be relevant for the future of money. So uh, we spend a lot of time talking with central banks as well as regulators around the world uh, on the topic of CBDC, uh, stable coins and all things to do with tokenization of deposit and assets. Um, so yeah, I'm very excited to be here and be able to talk with the panels. Thank you so much for joining us. It's about three o'clock in the morning. Thank you, Catherine. <laughs> That's dedication and passion. Thank you, thank you. Um, um, a quick introduction about myself. Uh, my name is Alagant. I'm a partner at EY and I lead our payments practice. And I think it's a very exciting time to be in payments. Payments is very much at the heart of digital economy um, with a volume of 240 trillion. And it's payments um, effectively is a strategic enabler of digital commerce. And I think we're entering an exciting phase of, of innovation or the next wave of innovation with new forms of digital money emerging. And I think it's really important to go into this space with a clear understanding of considerations, the driving forces, the guiding principles, and, and work together as public and private sectors in shaping that new ecosystem. Because ultimately in the future, it's all about providing value to consumers, to merchants, to corporates. Um, as part of this session, we'd like to refer to three, three documents that you may be very familiar with. Number one is the consultation, Bank of England, England consultation on CBDC. Um, and we're going to try to unpack it, and we're going to try to kind of explain all the, not just what's in the paper, but what's, what's the thought process behind it. Thank you, Nick. Um, the second document I'd like to refer to is the two recent speeches by Andrew Bailey and John Conliffe that refer to 
the lessons from the past and the shape of things to come. And I think the recent speeches took place over the last two weeks or in the month of April. And that just shows you the speed of change and the pace of change and how everybody and so many stakeholders are looking and thinking about it. So I really hope you enjoy the session because we really thought through that. Um, and what we're going to start off with is, is really with the CBDC consultation paper. We'd like to go and sort of think about it. Um, we're two months into the consultation. The, the um, responses are due on the, 5th of June, on the 7th of June. And essentially, the way we use money is changing. Um, at this stage, Bank of England uh, think that it's likely that digital pound will be needed in the future. It's too early to decide whether to introduce the digital pound. But it's clear that Bank, Bank of England is doing the prepar preparation, pre preparing for that. It will be a new form of sterling, similar to a digital banknote issued by the Bank of England, and it would be used by households and businesses for their everyday payment needs. It would be used in store, online, and to make payments to family and friends. If introduced, it would exist alongside and be easily ex exchangeable with cash and bank deposits. Um, we wanted to make the session academic but also practical and see how digital pound will interoperate and coexist with other types of digital currencies that are emerging, including tokenized deposits, stable coins, cryptocurrencies, if regulated. So we'll, we'll touch upon all those um, aspects. And I think it's important to have that holistic perspective around that new and emerging ecosystem. And with that, I'm going to ask Nick to start with the opening remarks and set the scene on, on CBDC. Thank you, Nick. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much and welcome everyone. Um, I've got some slides which hopefully can appear up on the screen magically at um, some point, but we'll see. They're not too, uh, they're not too essential. So, um, good afternoon all. It's a pleasure to be here today and I think really exciting um, kind of discussion that we've got um, ahead of us. I've already um, introduced myself, but one point that I wanted to make, I suppose just in terms of my background, which is uh, relevant. So. I'm an economist by background. I've worked within the monetary analysis area of the bank for, for some time. But I've also worked um, running the kind of front office um, operations in dealing room at the Bank of England, so doing our monetary policy and financial stability operations. And the reason why I think that's important is that in this discussion, bringing together some of the more kind of academic or theoretical considerations around CBDC but also the practical application of it and the kind of design choices that need to be made is really important and hopefully will make uh, sometimes what can seem a little bit baffling seem a bit more kind of concrete and real. And I hope we can get into that in the Q&A um, session as well. So in recent years, I think the prominence of digital currencies within perhaps not broad public discourse, but um, you know, discourse within certain more expert circles has certainly changed quite a lot. A number of years ago, I remember when I used to go along to uh, things like the um, money market conferences, for example, which is quite an um, academic conference in the UK, you'd sometimes have slightly wonkish kind of conversations about CBDC, you know, at the corners of a monetarist academic paper kind of discussion of, of monetary policy. And that's really changed. We're in a room today with people who are, you know, central bankers, people who are policy makers, uh, people who are financial market uh, participants, academics, um, but also um, lawyers and practitioners as well. So that's been a really big change. And it's been a big change for central banks as well. So we saw some of the figures earlier in terms of the number of central banks that are engaged in, in work in this area. But it's around 90% of surveyed central banks have some form of work happening in this space. So I want to talk a little bit at the beginning about why this has happened and the why leads into why we think that a central bank digital currency may be lightly in the future. And I put a heavy emphasis there around lightly. So that's going to be the focus and hopefully we can get into some of the detail during Q&A. But first of all, I wanted to start with some fairly basic sort of definitional stuff because this, and we've already seen it within the discussions, can be something that um, there are lots of questions about and uh, maybe can cause a, a little bit of confusion. 
So point one, from my perspective, is that our work and most of what I'm going to talk about today centres on retail CBDC. And what I mean by retail CBDC is a, um, a money that is used by households for their everyday payments. So it might be between each other, uh, but it could also be with corporates, so going and doing their shopping or managing their day-to-day -day, um, affairs. So that's the first point. The second point is, well, the clues in the name, this is a central bank digital currency, so emphatically it's got the central bank in the heart of it, and the claim is directly on the central bank. That's very much like a banknote. Um, I'll come back to that point uh, later on within the presentation. But my point three is that unlike a banknote, this would be digital. I mean, in some ways, I'm just unpacking what CBDC is here. And that's important because it should have a greater relevance to our day-to-day -day lives and how the economy is changing. Um, so now, hopefully, we've got this clear. We can move on to uh, the question of why are we all looking at this. Sorry, Ella, I've realised I've got someone's phone there, so I'll just put that, put that down there. Um, so we can hopefully move on to the next slide, which I'm going to lead up to. And I think the two key trends that are relevant to why there's so much focus on digital currencies at the moment, both within the public sector and also within the private sector. The first of those is that cash usage is declining. This will be familiar to all of you from your day-to-day -day experience, but let's put some numbers around it. Ten years ago, 50%, over 50% of the volume of payments within the UK were made in physical cash. Now, that may be hard to believe now, and in some ways that's borne out by the latest data, which are 15% of the volume of payments now are in cash. And that may well fall further. We can look at countries like Norway and Sweden, where that's closer to 5%. Now, I want to be really clear here, and this is actually part of the responsibilities I've had over the past few years. The UK authorities are emphatically committed to preserving access to cash for those who want to use it to make uh, payments. And there's legislation going through um, Parliament at the moment. It's in quite an advanced stage in the Financial Services and Markets Bill. And that's going to protect access to cash, but it's also going to make sure that the wholesale distribution system that underpins it remains fit for purpose and is well regulated. Nevertheless, it's just a clear consequence of the way that our lives are evolving that cash is less relevant, perhaps, to some in their day-to-day -day lives. There are a couple of really obvious examples of that. One is that it's pretty cumbersome to do online shopping using cash. You can technically do it. You can go to your local Tesco or Sainsbury's and buy a voucher and use that to make a transaction online. But none of us really do that in, in practice. So that's been a big driver of change. The other is obviously the changes in technology that we have available for us. And there's very significant market uh, penetration there. So around 90% of people in the UK now use contactless uh, payment to, to, make, uh, to make everyday payments. So that's a, a really significant change and accelerated during the COVID pandemic. The second key development is that new forms of digital money have been emerging for some time. And those have taken... This is both digital money, actually, I should say, and also digital payment have been emerging for some time. And these include things like e-money, digital wallets, there's obviously stable coins are being talked about a lot, and tokenised uh, deposits, both in the retail and the wholesale setting. And I think those are perhaps best viewed collectively as a response to the increasing digitalisation of our economy rather than individual development. So they all have a kind of common root cause in terms of our modern economy um, that sits behind them. Now, at the bank, and I think this is true for many other central banks, but certainly at the bank, um, who I can speak for, I can't speak for others, these things really matter, and they inform our assessment of the likely need for a CBDC, or what I'll call probably much to the Digital Pound Foundation's joy, the Digital Pound, which is uh, what we've decided to call it. So inform what we think of as the um, likely need for it. So the first of these is the need to be able to value the robustness of all monies within uh, the UK. And we have a very nice uh, explanation of this uh, earlier, so I'll, I'll, I'll give it another run as well. But 
physical cash traditionally has played that anchoring role. So you could convert into um, banknotes or coins at any point in time if you wanted to. And that could give you confidence in using other forms of money that had easy convertibility into them. But we've seen, first of all, that we've got changes in cash use, which make that more difficult to do. But also the emergence of new forms of money where that convertibility into um, cash might not be as straightforward. And so we need to think about how the right to convert um, private money into um, public money effectively needs to evolve to be able to support the financial system. So this effectively is the argument in, in the blue box. The second is that we talked about innovation happening. There's different forms of money, different forms of payment. Innovation normally brings around many benefits to consumers and firms, but it does also present some risks. And when we're thinking about the kinds of money and payment changes in digitalization, there's a lot of data involved in that. And the combination of those things can give rise to quite powerful network effects. And this can lead to fairly classic economic problems of market concentration, potentially walled gardens, or a reduction in interoperability. So the ability to be able to move with low friction and low cost between different forms of money. And we're arguing that publicly provided digital currency um, can help play an important role in guarding against those risks, but also promoting um, innovation. Um, so I think it's worth going on to the next slide just to make that a bit more concrete in terms of how we would envisage uh, doing this. And I notice Swift seems to be supporting all of our slides today. I'm not quite sure what's happening there, but these are Bank of England's uh, materials rather than Nick Swift. Nick is very happy. <laughs> Thank you. In a free, free blood list too. Uh, but these are my, my materials, different Nick. Um, so this uh, slide summarises a key aspect of the uh, design architecture that we're setting out, and this is really central to the approach. Private partner, uh, pri public-private partnership. And we call this the platform model. Now, within this, the central bank is providing a core ledger. So um, this is at the, at the top. Um, and the idea there is that this is you know, robust, resilient, fast, and efficient um, ledger that the store of value is going to be held on. So if you're a user of this, you always have a claim directly um, on the Bank of England, and you can trust that claim. Um, the idea then, though, is that the user-facing elements of this, the customer experience, you'll be glad to hear, is not going to be handled by the central bank. I think that would be, for many people, um, some idea of hell. But instead will be provided by the private sector. So they would offer, we call these PIPs, but effectively you, you can think of them as digital wallets, and you're going to be able to store your CBDC within a digital wallet. There are many advantages, potentially, of that. So the onboarding experience, for example, would be um, handled by, by the private sector. Things like AML and CFT checks could be done by them as well, and this could support innovation in the technologies that are used to do those. But also customer-enhancing um, technologies and approaches could also be offered um, at this layer as well. And we have a bit of terminology of ESIPs. I won't get into too much, but they're sort of they could add a potentially kind of ancillary type services around this. And there might be, um, for some of you who are familiar with open banking, you might have seen examples of those kind of um, third party services that are being offered. And this is obviously facilitated by an API layer. For those of you who are technologists who understand that far better than me, for those who aren't, it's just the connection effectively um, between the private uh, sector wallets and the core ledger. And the idea here really is that this plays to the comparative advantages of the public and private sector. That's important because it means that the PIPs and the ESIPs can help focus on providing diverse and innovative solutions, but they're not providing a custodial service. The claim is always on the Bank of England. They don't have to run really big and expensive infrastructure to be able to do this, and that helps lower barriers to entry, and it helps promote innovation and competition. So I'm just going to bring up now a next slide, and I'm going to conclude at this point, because I wanted to keep these remarks relatively um, short. Don't worry, I'm not going to talk through all of these, but I talked about making this practical in terms of what CBDC means, and this slide 
summarises at a relatively high level a range of other design choices that we've set out within the consultation paper uh, that we published a couple of months ago. And these range from things like the public-private partnership model to the fact that we suggest that we wouldn't pay interest, how we plan to handle some of those risks around disintermediation and financial stability by using limits, uh, for example, um, but also the level of access. So we see this as a domestic form of money and payments, but we do also think there should be non-resident um, access to it as well. So those are a few of the points that I'll pick out, but hopefully, and hopefully you can see it okay, this can be a useful um, source of kind of inspiration for the discussion that we're going to have, might give you some ideas about questions that we could pick up in the panel. And I think that's a good opportunity at that point to um, conclude and, and go into that panel. Thank so you. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Nick. Um, I think with that, I'd like to ask Catherine perhaps to provide uh, some opening remarks and thoughts or reflections. Um, if you like, Catherine. Sounds good. Um, I think there's a lot that I echo with what Nick is saying, and specifically maybe starting from the uh, public and private partnership. I think that's really important. And I guess just to unpack um, how we are sort of thinking about it and what we're sharing with central banks as we're looking at CBDC, I think it's really important, right, to have this mentality about being very user centric and really trying to think about what that experience as well as the infrastructure, the type of services you might need for the user. So coming from that perspective, there are about, I think, three key principles, at least from, you know, as we're looking at um, uh, CBDC from a product angle, this is how we're thinking about it. Um, number one, I would say, is about the commercial bank readiness. Uh, number two is on developer uh, friendly ecosystem and the third is on um, merchant acceptance so I'm just gonna kind of go through uh, each of these uh, briefly I think when it comes to commercial bank readiness and I think this is well known um, in every single country almost likely you're gonna have a two-tier system design to some level or extent you're gonna as a central bank they'll be working closely with the financial intermediaries trying to distribute that amount of money um, and I think specific in the Bank of England case, there's a very well-defined structure of how the public and private partnership will evolve. So as we're thinking about the readiness coming from the commercial bank perspective, if, you know, if a digital pound is happening in three, four years down the road, I don't know, I'm just giving a random number here, but the point is commercial banks need to be ready uh, to be able to distribute that money. And there's a lot to think from uh, in terms of the services they will have to provide, i.e. things like KYC, AMLs and such, how is that going to be critically integrated into that existing banking application or banking system overall, and how they might even, you know, things like wallet infrastructure, what that might look like, etc. So things like that, I think when it comes to detailed design choices, it matters a lot. And hence, I think there's a decent, I, I guess, number of years of runway for the banks to prepare, but the crucial thing is, it has to work very closely with the public sector to really make sure that the design choice is chosen appropriately. So that's number one. I think number two, when it comes to developer friendly ecosystem, it sort of echoes a lot into um, what Nick was saying about this platform model, um, but also kind of looking closely on the recent development around stable coins. I think there's a huge lesson to be learned in the sense that you know, money can be programmable. Um, it doesn't, it's not only just a medium of exchange. In the future, with the technology itself, you can really build things on top of the money. So money becomes a platform. And hence, I think there's a lot of exciting opportunities down the road to which uh, different business ideas and stuff can be just happening organically on top of this uh, new kind of programmable platform. But to enable that to happen, we have to ensure a system that is both compliant, but also very friendly for the selected type of developers and companies to be able to build on top of that. You know, things like, you know, how can I create a great user experience that can leverage these digital money in the future, as well as, um, you know, things like the, some really relevant things around how could you create, say, an offline experience for the, that digital version of cash. There's tons of, I think, new innovations can be built uh, if we can ensure that this platform is uh, accessible uh, for others, for builders to be able to build on top of that. 
And the last but not, not the least is around this very basic but important principle around merchant acceptors. And I think this is where you can draw a lot of lessons from other countries as well, in which we have seen uh, introduction of retail CBDCs across places like in the Caribbean, in Nigeria as well. I think there's a there's a pain point in the system essentially when it comes to adoption. If the merchants are not ready and the point of acceptance is not um, designed appropriately to accommodate this new form factor of money, uh, you're going to see a lot of friction in the economy for people to spend as well as to store these money um, with respect to how they deal with these kind of digital new CBDCs. So to that effect, it's very important before the release of a CBDC to ensure that uh, the merchant acceptance is ready to go. And I think to that point, maybe just to even begin with, we <laughs> emphasize a lot on this notion of backward compatibility in the sense when CBDC will first get introduced, we should hopefully uh, anticipate all of the existing payment rails uh, and system will be able to support that because over time um, that this is when we think merchant will you know, invest significant amount of uh, money to, to be able to upgrade that infrastructure accordingly. Thank you very much, Catherine, and thank you for bringing a very practical, pragmatic perspective around it. That was really useful. Um, okay, and Rhiannon, would you like to share maybe your thoughts and reflections sort of around Digital Pound, but through the lens of commercial banks? We know that uh, bank deposits represent 85, 90% of money in circulation, which is uh, a large chunk of money. Um, and how would that um, coexist with Digital Pound? Yes, thank you. Um, I mean, I think it's fair to say, well, first of all, I have to caveat all my comments as UK Finance. You know, we represent a huge array of firms across the full ecosystem as the Trade Association for Financial Services. <clears throat> and so I think inevitably, you know, what I see is a really diverse set of opinions forming. And, you know, we've been really heartened that the bank is definitely taking the approach that this is a marathon, not a sprint. Um, you know, they want to bring the industry on the journey with them. Um, and to make sure that all these really deep and kind of important design choices, you know, implicit and explicit kind of driving forces for why a CBDC, a digital pound, would be the right choice for the UK. They want that explored properly um, in the right contexts, and indeed not only across industry, but civil society as well, which um, I think is important and I know we'll come on to um, later. Um, so as I said, I think, you know, the, the membership that we represent has very diverse views on this, and I think that will continue to evolve and mature. Um, the industry, I think, is really appreciative of an opportunity like a big consultation like this to really kind of draw a line and say, okay, what do we think about things at this point in time? Um, and I think that's why, you know, we've said we're, we're really pleased that this is being approached as a kind of public-private partnership, um, an opportunity for financial services industry of all kind of colours and tribes, because I think there's, you know, FS doesn't just mean a single thing anymore, um, but that we do have the opportunity to kind of, you know, co-create, <laughs> think think really imaginatively with, with the central bank and regulators and government on these, on these issues. Um, and I think industry is really excited about some of the opportunities too. I mean, clearly, you know, a lot of our, our responses to the consultation will be going into the detail about, you know, okay, well, this is, question hasn't been answered, how might we think about this? What are some alternatives to this approach? And that's the right thing to do. That's the purpose of the consultation. Um, but there's also a lot of excitement, a lot of sense of you know coming on a journey, um, wanting to think about the best ways of delivering um, some of these things. And also, we heard in the earlier sessions today that you know this isn't new. You know, a lot of this has been around for some time. And so actually, it's about thinking what's going to come next. And if we're going to think about a digital pound that would come in by 2030. You know what's going to be happening in 2030 and how would we design a digital pound now that would be suitable and efficient and helpful for a kind of you know 2030 UK um, so I, I think you know looking at the consultation process and we're kind of in the middle of that now so you know no no final positions um, on anything but I'd say actually I can't say there's a <laughs> there's a small number there's a very long list of things we'll, we'll be talking about and I think that's all going to be really helpful but if I just picked out kind of three of the headline um, kind of issues that we've been talking a lot about in all of the industry groups, um, of which there's a lot. I mean, I'd say the first has already been touched on by some of the great panellists we had earlier as well, um, which is the impact on the health of the economy um, and the ability of banks to continue to lend and create credit. Um, probably understandably, that will be a core kind of area of focus for us in industry um, as we seek to kind of unpick 
what are some of the unintended consequences of, of introducing CBDC and how that might impact on kind of the health of the UK's economy, GDP, um, lending to businesses and consumers. Um, we did a paper last year um, that analysed kind of impacts on credit creation from the introduction of a CBDC and that kind of estimated potentially that um, you know, if you had the associated deposit flight with CBDC, you might kind of lose up to 20% of the credit creation opportunities in the UK. Um, so we're going to continue to expand on that as an industry to see kind of what are the opportunities um, for minimising some of those risks, um, and also what you know what what might come. You know, we've seen in the past, and certainly in payments, you'll all be familiar that sometimes when a gap emerges, you know, things come in to fill that gap, which actually for, for UK consumers and businesses and regulators, those things are less desirable. So actually, how can we ensure that there is no ensuing gap and that this kind of natural evolution, which um, all financial services participants recognise, is an ongoing state? Um, you know, we always hear this point that you know we're not perfect. There's no there's no standing still point. To this natural evolution. Um, I'd say the second kind of big issue that we're exploring quite strongly is around the prioritisation of strategic initiatives. So what else are we doing in the UK at the moment around payments? Um, again, not much, not much. <laughs> yeah. Only in VA. Yeah. Small, small little other projects that the industry is currently also investing heavily in. Um, so I guess that, that needs to be really thought about. Um, we heard another panellist earlier say, you know, kind of the, the risk of actually slowing down investment in some of those areas if if firms feel that, you know, that, that a decision is, is going to be kind of delayed or that a central bank digital currency might kind of lead to a diversion of, of resource. Um, but also really thinking holistically, um, joining the dots, you know, using some of these well-worn phrases, but actually how do you take things like RTGS, MPA, sorry, I'm assuming all of these things are well known to people, that the new payments architecture, our retail payments architecture, um, you know, even account-to-account account payments, which, you know, obviously we've been discussing a lot more in industry the last couple of years. Um, all of these are very kind of, you know, timely and important discussions to have all at the same time. So um, we're trying to link that together and really make sure that, again, we think forward and think, you know, what, what does the UK need? Do we need three or four competing retail payment infrastructures? Question mark. Um, and then the third area, I mean, as I said, there's a, there is a long list, but I think the other area we're really interested in is alternative ways of delivering some of the opportunities of a central bank digital currency. So the consultation paper rightly points out that there's lots of different ways you could approach this question. Um, and actually, that, you know, we've been hearing a lot in those speeches you referenced um, about tokenized bank deposits. And I think on, in both of those speeches, they've reiterated the ongoing importance of kind of the two-tier um, monetary system. Um, and actually thinking about whether, I mean, we heard about RLN earlier as well, um, this kind of unified ledger approach where you might not just have access to digital central bank money, but also access to digital commercial bank money alongside that and the kind of um, efficiencies that might achieve. Um, and I, that slide we had earlier as well about the kind of natural progression in all things that go from interlinking different ledgers to eventually a single ledger. So I think that probably also gives us maybe this outline view that, Perhaps in the future, that's where we're heading anyway. So um, three, three really big topics, top of a long list, um, but it's such a fascinating um, thing to be exploring alongside the bank. Um, perfect. Very interesting. Oh, that was absolutely perfect. And you have a big task ahead of you the next week. You'll be very busy. On the 7th of June, I think we'll have all a party <laughs> after you <laughs> consolidate it and have a balanced view um, in response to consultation paper. Well, with that, I think I'd like to tackle the the. the point around inside-outside money. Why don't we try to demystify that with um, Nick's help, perhaps? So Andrew Bailey, in his speech, the Governor of Bank of England, um, in his speech about monetary and financial stability, introduces the notion of inside money and outside money, emphasizing the role of digital commercial bank money. And he's, just to quote, commercial bank money is inside money, and the central bank money is outside money. We regulate banks in good part because money is a public good. Inside or commercial bank money is now the dominant type of money, and that supports the provision of credit in economies. Um, would you like to comment and um, just talk a little bit about it? Yeah, I think that's right. Um, I mean, one, inside money and outside money tends to cause kind of endless confusion because it's almost <laughs> the exact opposite way around to what most people would expect, I think. But um, it, both forms of money have been a feature of our economy for you know, a very significant um, period of time. And, I mean, one of the things that's quite interesting, actually, is if we think about the form of central bank money that's been available to, to most people for longest, that's, of course, um, banknotes. 
Um, from a Bank of England perspective, you know, we were set up in 1694. I mean, relatively early in the 18th century, we started issuing um, banknotes in a kind of standard form. So originally, they were for very specific amounts um, used to settle very specific um, debts, and then they moved into um, a form of, um, you know, standard units, effectively, so they could be used more easily to facilitate trade. And one of the things that's interesting in that context, I suppose, is that that use until relatively recently has endured, actually, for a very long period of time. So we're going you know, back to the beginning of the 18th century, obviously, coin uh, before then. And for part of that period, you've operated in a model which, in a way, is a bit like a platform model, actually. So we, we print uh, banknotes. But we don't distribute them around the country. We use the set of four commercial um, operators who are subject to some scheme rules. We sell those in some sort of almost wholesale transactions in large blocks of notes. And then they have arrangements with the endpoint. So retailers uh, may need floats of money that they get, or it may be ATMs that get stocked. And what's interesting is that variations in that framework have existed for a long period of time and yet they facilitated a very large range of use cases. So, you know, it's been possible in the last few years to go and buy an iPhone with cash, for example, and I don't think anyone back in sort of 1720, when these changes started to occur, would have possibly foreseen that that would have been the case. There are challenges now, and I think we're reaching that sort of technological frontier, at least for... Um, you know, retail central bank money, where it needs to really evolve if it's to be relevant to people's day-to-day -day lives. Um, and we're also, and we might touch on this later, I think, but we're also thinking about how the evolution of our other form of central bank money, which is central bank reserves, which are obviously really important for wholesale market participants, um, particularly banks, need to be able to evolve as well to be able to support better um, both new technologies within wholesale financial markets, and that includes the application of DLT to wholesale markets, but also how those can evolve to better support cross-border um, financial transactions as well. So this isn't a... It's both not a one-horse race from a public-private uh, mm -hmm. perspective, but it's mm -hmm. not a one-horse race from a retail-wholesale perspective either. Mm -hmm. We'd love to talk about the wholesale use case because uh, the current consultation paper is really focused on retail, yeah. but it feels like we're trying to future-proof the existing current sort of traditional forms of money and prepare for that future. And I think UK is, as a market has always been at the forefront of innovation and I think perhaps this is part of that sort of staying ahead of the uh, ahead of other markets. Um, a couple of questions I wanted to tackle and then we we're going to open up for Q&A. The privacy, offline payments and then retail versus wholesale. Um, so shall we talk a little bit about privacy? Are there any concerns from a privacy point of view of, of the digital pound? Are there or not? Are we trying to think, how do, how do we, Nick or uh, Catherine or Nick, Nick would you like I'm, to? I'm to happy to start. I'd be really yeah. interested in other people's perspectives on this. I mean, yes, I think, you know, privacy is absolutely critical. So we talked earlier about, you know, the role in sort of anchoring the, the, the system and how public money can do that. But that fundamentally is built on trust. You know, financial system depends on, on trust. And we've got a lot of different sort of examples of why that trust is important. So the Information Commissioner's Office did um, some research a couple of years ago that showed that within sort of financial services, this was an absolutely first-order issue for the general public. So it really matters for, for adoption. We talked quite a bit about our consultation paper, but I was also involved in two previous discussion papers, one of which was way back in, well, not that far back, but in 2020, it feels like there's been a lot of water under the bridge. And we got a very large number of responses on that about privacy and how important it was and how it could shape adoption and the need to take it seriously. So I think from our perspective, both from Bank of England and broader HM government, that message is kind of loud and clear and well understood. I think there's a few ways that you can respond to it, just very briefly. So the first one is sort of legal framework, if you like, and that's that any future um, digital currency would have the same level of protection that commercial bank money has at the moment, so same level of um, data protection and privacy protection that's already the case. The second one actually goes back to the platform model, which is 
privacy by design effectively. So within this, we've got a core ledger and we've got third parties offering the wallets. The privacy design of it actually goes a stage further than that. And that is on the ledger, we do not need to and we do not want to and we do not propose to store any user identifying information on the ledger. So that will only be handled by the third party. So they will do the KYC work, they will do the AML, they will do the CFT. And the Bank of England, as an operator of the ledger, would not even see that um, information. So there's a sort of privacy by design element of this that I think is quite important. Um, the third, then, is that I think if you've got this um, framework where you have lots of different um, wallet providers or PIPs providing those user-facing fa user services, then choice over privacy becomes a clearer issue than perhaps it is today. So it may be that some people are really bothered about privacy and that they migrate to a particular wallet that's offering CBDC with very strong kind of protections around that. It may be that other people, they're not terribly bothered about their privacy. They might want to enjoy some discounts at stores that they um, use and they could choose a wallet that offered that. But the point is the choice would be more explicit. And so that may mean that the benefit that they get for providing some of their data is, is clearer. So I think those are some of the key features that we've been um, thinking about as we've oh, been it's working very, It's very helpful, and I think it's very intentional to sort of be aware of privacy considerations, and it's not just replicating other CBDC model that exists. Yeah, elsewhere. there's one final point I'll make, that I think sometimes privacy and anonymity get used a little bit interchangeably, and that is important. I don't think you can have a, a new form of digital money that is you know, very low friction, uh, very low cost, very efficient in terms of the transfers that it's facilitating and make that anonymous because I talked about the you know your client, AML, CFT. You can't do those with an anonymous um, token or an anonymous um, payment system. So I think that's outside of scope, mm. but very high levels of privacy, I think, are something that is yeah. central to the design. Thank you. Um, the next area we wanted to talk about is offline payments and the role of Digital Pound and how would Digital Pound enable uh, offline payments. Catherine, would you like to tackle that? Sounds good. Um, I you. think this is a really important area. It goes back to um, this objective, I guess, around having a digital version of cash. And of course, I think there's a lot of benefits um, with re regard to why this could be um, say alternative form of payments say when uh, you know the online system is not working properly you want to have a backup system or things coming from a financial inclusion perspective that you want to have access for those who might not have a bank account uh, but can still access cash today so then they should be able to access that through some ways uh, in the future so um, I can share a bit about offline how we're thinking about it from a technology perspective um, so I guess back in 2020, we released this paper around the offline payment system, actually very much in line with thinking about a two-tier uh, CBDC design, um, in which we were like looking at inspiration from this notion of public key infrastructures and what that means when it, you know, be implemented into a monetary system. And this is where you're really looking at central banks sitting at the very core of that whole construct in which they're sort of the ultimate authority who can set the governance and set the supplies and et cetera. But then they can delegate a lot of these tasks down to the trusted entities who can then carry out a lot of these day-to-day -day operations for them. Underneath this sort of two-tier design, we then envision, you know, having wallet providers down on this uh, payment tier. So you have the infrastructure tier in which the central bank plays the prominent role. And then you have the sort of the more payment tier in which it is the financial intermediaries who are interacting directly with the users. How can they enable things like offline? And this is really leveraging sort of some of the latest technologies, i.e. if you're looking at how to leverage your secure uh, execution environment inside a mobile phone. And this is normally, I guess, available for any mobile phone that was produced since 2016. They have these sort of hardware element already embedded into that. What kind of logic can you embed directly into these phones such that in the future, these hardware devices can physically, in a way, lock these uh, digital money inside these devices and be used uh, for payments uh, if you're kind of in certain situations that uh, would require offline payments. 
And this system design is really trying to think about things like, you know, we, it's really important, for example, to avoid double spending, right? So then a money cannot exist at the same time when it's both online and offline. So there has to be a very secure mechanism to ensure that when you're withdrawing these money as digital version of cash into your phone, that's, that money is no longer available on your online account. And once, as a user, you have these uh, money, I'd like to see them as being downloaded onto your phone, then the question is, to whom can you spend this money? Uh, imagine you're going to a merchant store that the merchant doesn't have a sort of this sort of upgraded device. Can the merchant at least accept this form of offline money? The answer is yes. Uh, versus another more novel situation, you're paying to a friend, i.e. a P2P payment, in which your friend also has a mobile phone, has this sort of secure hardware and being authenticated and authorized. They can then accept this offline money and be able to spend it continuously in an offline fashion onward for a secondary transaction. All these things, actually, we, we have tested it. It's very much research, I think, but I think there's a lot of kind of uh, new ways you can enable money uh, and the spending experience uh, to be had. Having said all of that, though, I think one thing important to highlight is that there are still a lot of risks uh, entailed with offline payments. I think it's important to note that I think the, you know, the entire uh, payments ecosystem will always kind of move towards more digital uh, version of things, right, because there's much better experience protections and stuff in place. So as we're looking at offline um, payment systems, there's a lot of potential trade-offs to be had, and hence it's really important as any central bank or as, as any company wanting to implement this, one thing is to ensure that security aspect uh, is, uh, is protected. And also I think that comes to the potential com commercial viability aspect of how a private entity may implement this in a successful way at scale uh, and be able to provide a range of services, um, including things like, you know, if you lose your mobile phone device or other sort of hardware device that physically kind of have these money, would it be able to recover some of that, right? Could you also conduct traceability while ensuring things like privacy as well? So I think there's still a range of um, uh, extra um, services and things to be to be considered, but this is where I, I would say a huge amount of innovation continues to take place. Thank you, that was great. In, can, in can I just add in just one comment there? I mean, I think actually um, Catherine touched on it, but I think, you know, my fraud and police unit teams would be <laughs> cross with me if I didn't mention that clearly that's one of the areas that industry is really interested in looking at is kind of, you know, the fraud risks um, for consumers around offline payments. And I think clearly we know scammers and criminals are always going to target kind of, you know, those weaker spots in the system. And, you know, that may well be one of them. But the kind of interesting tension with that is that offline payments is also one of those exciting things that makes, a, you know, possibly makes CBDC more like a cash proxy, because, you know, you've got that ability to use it, you know, up a mountain with no battery or no internet signal, potentially. Um, and you've also got that opportunity for, for digital and financial inclusion. So for those, for those individuals who feel much less confident using kind of, you know, um, apps on phones, you know, there might be smart car technology other forms of technology, you know, that, that can actually enable consumers to to utilise a, a CBDC in a more cash-like way, which I think actually is a really interesting kind mm. of angle that we want to explore um, as part of the consultation. Wonderful, lots to think about. I would have one more question, and then maybe we have a Q and A if that's okay. Let's talk a little bit about um, tokenized commercial bank money. So, in his speech, John Cunliffe says that. Some banks in the UK and other jurisdictions have been exploring investing in development of tokenized deposits as settlement, as settlement assets on new forms of ledger. Um, and the majority of this effort appears to have centered on wholesale um, as opposed to retail. And in regulatory terms, the tokenization of bank deposits is a much simpler proposition than non-bank stable coins at this stage. What are your thoughts about the opportunities um, for commercial banks and the role they can play? Would you like to? Yeah, <laughs> I mean, I, I touched on it a bit in my opening comments. I mean, that's definitely one of the avenues that industry is, you know, really interested in exploring at the minute. Um, I think, you know, we're we're very much kind of enthused to hear that, you know, there's, there is a continued acceptance of, you know, the 85 to 95 percent of the kind of existing money that's out there, and and what we can do to continue to innovate off the back of that. Um, I think that's really positive. It also might be, as I said earlier, kind of, you know, that the future of CBDC is more along the lines of a unified but partitioned ledger that allows access to digital central bank money and digital commercial bank money. 
Um, I mean, I think, you know, we, we, we also want to just be kind of realistic. We can't boil the ocean, and I think there is so much to unpick with a design of, you know, a CBDC, but um, to, 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 to the minds of many in the industry, I think there is, there is a, a lot of opportunity to explore around tokenized bank deposits for some of the reasons that were mentioned in the speech in terms of, you know, you can kind of fast track to some of, you know, to a more advanced place of discussion because you've already got that regulatory, you know, kind of wrap around and kind of, you know, the security that all of those provisions are already made. Um, so I'd say that it's it's a it's a really you know interesting time for development and thinking on those points, um, and and there does seem to have been a bit of a kind of coming together of thinking on the central bank part. You know, if we look at the Biz speech, the Bank of England speeches, that actually you know it's really making sure that you know we're not saying you know that we want a digital pound to be the only game in town. You know, there, there needs to be lots of other private sector innovation, and that's hugely positive for the banks. Thank you. Yeah, I'll just come in briefly on that because I think that last point is critical and I suspect not for this audience, which is fairly kind of um, expert but sometimes gets misunderstood. I mean, the, the idea of the CBDC is not to be sort of monolithic. I mean, it's to be one form of many forms of money that are available within the economy. So, you know, you could have a world in which the central bank is providing CBDC and still providing cash and it may be that cash is being used by a relatively smaller share of the population but you could definitely envisage that alongside um, commercial bank um, deposits which you know may evolve in a variety of different ways and then obviously there are stable coins as well which are part of the picture and the UK authorities doing a lot of work there both in terms of there's clear expectations that have been set out by the FPC so in very simple terms they're saying if it's a form of money, it needs to be regulated to the same standards as other forms of money. And if it's a form of payment, it needs to be regulated to similar standards as other forms of um, payments. And there's a regulatory regime which is being enabled by um, legislation at the moment. So the point there, in a way, is that you can have a lot of diversity and choice in these forms of money. I think the one thing that we really care about within that and coming back to original point about the likely need for the pound, that second motivation, you should be able to move between all of those monies very seamlessly. They should be what we refer to as interoperable with each other. So there are low costs, there are no barriers effectively, and that creates the kind of vibrancy. The problem or the risk is that you end up with these different forms of money, but you have significant frictions or costs in moving between them, and that could create you know, consumer detriment or uh, economic inefficiency. Very good point. Uh, I think my takeaway is that we are looking for a regulated alternative. We're trying to enhance the existing forms of money and make them digital, make them smarter through new technologies that we have, which is programmability, tokenization, smart contracts. So, and then in ultimately enable atomic instant settlement to ultimately reduce cost and improve speed um, of payments.